Now that you have a good comprehension of the structure of DNA and how it works, maybe we should talk about DNA technology, because it's becoming more and more common for DNA technologies to affect our lives. And I've noticed that whenever DNA technology is discussed outside of science classrooms, they tend to have a kind of sinister mysticism around them. They seem almost spooky. When you go to the grocery store, you see all kinds of labels that say no GMOs, non-GMO crops. Well, what does GMO really mean? Genetically modified organism. How are we genetically modifying them? And why are they so proudly saying that they don't have any of that? Or maybe you see a blog post that warns about the dangers of designer babies and how CRISPR-Cas9 might uh, change the face of medical treatment in the future. Or maybe you're watching television and a news broadcast comes on and they tell you about some criminal that was put away based on DNA evidence. Well, it might be a good idea to understand how DNA evidence works if you're ever finding yourself on a jury. So let's say we're investigating a crime, a microscope has been stolen from the lab, and we don't know who the culprit is. Ah, but the culprit made a mistake. He left behind an eyelash, and that eyelash has a follicular tag on the end of it which contains lots of DNA. Early forensic scientists would often collect samples from crime scenes, and there would be DNA in the samples, but not enough DNA to actually test with. Now, that's no longer an insurmountable barrier, because we have a new technology called PCR. As you know, DNA is a two-stranded molecule, and each strand of DNA has complementary bases that match up with the nucleotides on the opposite DNA strand, and that this is very important for the way that DNA replicates itself. Using DNA helicase, we can split this DNA molecule and use DNA polymerase in order to create a duplicate strand. This is normal DNA replication, after all. Polymerase chain reaction is superficially similar to regular DNA replication, except that in order to split the two strands from each other, we just heat it up to about 92 degrees centigrade, which causes all of the hydrogen bonds holding the strands together to kind of shake loose. And then we use an enzyme called TAC polymerase in order to do the actual work of replication. If we run this process over and over and over again, even the tiniest sample of DNA can become large enough for us to actually work with. This is why you sometimes hear of cold cases suddenly being solved because new DNA evidence was presented. A good forensic technician collected the evidence and put it into the proper storage container, knowing that right now they couldn't test it for DNA, but that there might be some minute traces later on when technology improved. Now finally we have enough DNA to work with here, but we still don't know whose DNA it is. So what we're going to have to do is generate what's called a DNA fingerprint, then collect samples from DNA from some of our suspects and compare their DNA fingerprints to our DNA fingerprints. One way to obtain a DNA fingerprint is to use a technology called gel electrophoresis. In gel electrophoresis, our DNA sample is loaded into a micropipetter, which can deliver very precise amounts of DNA into a well. The well is in a little rectangular wedge, which is made out of a kind of gel that we call agarose. It's actually made from a seaweed derivative. It has a consistency somewhere in between uh, jello jigglers and rubber. After this process is finished, we'll be able to see the DNA in the gel because it will fluoresce under a black light thanks to certain chemical compounds that are involved in the gel and the loading dye. I hope that you remember that the structure of DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone. That is, you have a phosphate group attached to a 5-carbon sugar, and then each 5-carbon sugar has a nitrogenous base. That's your A, T, C, or G. The sugar phosphate backbone is what holds the strand together, but phosphate groups are negatively charged and thus the DNA molecule itself has a negative charge. And you may remember from way back in Unit 1 that if you put two negative charges next to each other, they repel. You put a negative and a positive charge next to each other, they attract. So we apply a current through this gel, we attach it to a power source, put the negative end over near where the DNA was loaded, and we put the positive end on the opposite side of the gel. The DNA will be attracted to the positive side, so it will begin moving through the gel. On a microscopic level, the gel is a matrix with some open spaces and some blocked off spaces, kind of making it like a little obstacle course for the DNA to run through. Because of all of these obstacles, long segments of DNA will get blocked much more easily than short segments of DNA, so the short segments will run ahead further and the long segments will lag behind.
But wait, why is the DNA in different segments at all? Well, that's thanks to another enzyme that we use in an earlier step in this technology, which we refer to as a restriction endonuclease, or a restriction enzyme. One of the most common ones is called ECO-R1. Each restriction enzyme searches the DNA molecule for a particular recognition site, which is something we call a palindrome. The reason we call it a palindrome is because if you read these segments of DNA, they will read the same on the top strand as they do on the bottom strand, provided you flip one around backwards. So for ECO-R1, it's searching for the sequence G-A-A-T-T-C on the top and C-T-T-A-A-G on the bottom. Once they find the recognition site, they go to work and they break it in half, acting kind of like a pair of molecular scissors. Now, every person is going to have a unique sequence of DNA, so these palindromes will show up in more locations or fewer locations for each person, and the spaces between these palindromes will also be different, so every person will have their DNA cut into slightly different lengths of segments. Some people will have more short segments and other people more long segments. Because every person will have a different collection of segments, every person will have a unique genetic fingerprint. Thus, we can rule out suspects whose genetic fingerprint does not resemble that of the sample collected at the crime scene. Each time we run an electrophoresis gel, there is a small chance of error. There could be inconsistencies in the voltage from the power source, there could be inconsistencies in the consistency of the gel that we mixed up. So in order to be able to make sure that our results are accurate, we add in what's called a molecular ladder, which is a DNA sample that has segments of known sizes. 10,000 base pairs, 8,000 base pairs, 6,000 base pairs, all the way down to 250 base pairs. Notice that the largest segments stay at the top of the gel where we initially loaded it, whereas the largest ones travel further down. Fortunately, while we've been working in the lab, Detective Clouseau went out and collected some DNA samples from a couple of suspects. We can then compare their DNA fingerprint in the gel against the DNA fingerprint of our crime scene sample, and indeed, we do find a match. That definitively places that suspect at our crime scene, so investigators can take him into custody and subject him to further questioning. Since its foundation in 1992, the Innocence Project has managed to get 367 individuals that were serving time for crimes they did not commit exonerated based on DNA evidence. And of course, prosecutors also benefit greatly from the use of DNA technology. The combined DNA index system, called CODIS, allows investigators to compare DNA samples collected from crime scenes to a national database of known offenders. 